Good morning to you all. My name is Rashad Devon, the City Manager for the City of Alexandria. Uh, we have a very special work session uh, to occur this morning with the members of the City Council. Uh, first, before I make some introductory comments, I uh, want to just call your attention to our agenda. Uh, this is the welcome portion of the agenda, quite obviously. Uh, we will have a short presentation uh, following my comments uh, to City Council, and Council will have an opportunity to ask questions of staff. Uh, approximately 8.30-ish. Uh, we're a couple minutes behind that we will board uh, buses that are out front and take a uh, brief bus tour. Uh, please note that we this is a formal work session. Uh, and so in work session fashion, uh, there will be discussion from staff to the members of city council. There will be questions potentially from city council back to staff. Uh, the bus presentation isn't the opportunity to engage uh, and questions with staff and council by citizens. However, at the end of the bus tour, uh, we will have staff available uh, for citizens that want to ask questions based upon what they see in this presentation uh, or on the bus tour. Uh, and with that, let's talk about why we're here. Uh, we are here first to review the outcome of the community and councils and the land over several decades of labor to plan one of the largest the most important development projects in the city's history. When completed, this project will cover 235 acres and over 13 million square feet of development. It will add some $4 billion to the city's tax base and help generate substantial new tax revenues to help the city pay for city <coughs> and school services. Uh, the development has already or will provide in the future public benefits such as Land Bay K Park, the bus rapid transit on Route 1, and the already constructed new Route 1 bridge. The second primary reason that we're here today is to review what is to come and to understand the decisions that are facing us all as we move forward. Uh, specifically today, uh, you will get an update about the ongoing study to determine if, and if so, where a new metro rail station might be located. A metro rail station in has has long been discussed as part of Potomac Yard planning as the three and one half mile stretch of metro between Reagan Airport Metro Station and the Braddock Metro Station is the longest stretch of metro rail track in the inner core of our region without a metro rail station. However, given the cost and complexities of building a metro station, such a decision does not come easily or quickly. Today you'll be able to see the three main areas where the stations might be located and visually weigh in your minds the pros and cons of each location. Since we need to keep on schedule today, I now want to turn this over to Farrell Hammer and Rich Bear to give us an overview uh, before we start the bus tour. And I also want to thank our staff, Lee Farmer, Jeff Farmer, Beth Carton, and Kathleen Leonard for doing most of the heavy lifting and organizing today's work session. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Farrell Hammer. Hey. I just wanted to, again, thank my colleagues for agreeing to be part of this work session this morning with the bus tour and for the citizens and others who have come out to join us and we welcome that. Um, but what this was an idea of mine, uh, meeting with staff uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, I live in a neighborhood, a couple of us live close by, drive to it all the time, at the stores and everything else, but you see all this development going on and you get confused in terms of, well, what's going to happen here? What's going to go there? And, I, and things have shifted around. But more importantly, it's really about the impact and where, where the layout the laydown will go for the metro stick or the rail stop. And so I thought the better thing to do was for that. Because when we sit in meetings at City Hall, we get a bunch of papers, we get staff presentations. It's really hard to conceptually understand and appreciate well, where things are really going. Unless you, again, even when you're out here walking and driving, it's still hard to appreciate it. And so I thought the better thing to do is things are moving forward than they are, and that's very successful, that we have the opportunity to do a bus tour, stop, look at things, ask questions, so that in our own mind, when citizens ask us what's happening over there, what's going to go there, we can better respond. So that's why we're doing this again. Thank you for coming out and staff. Um, so, oh, thank you. Um, this is the largest, or it's very large, 230 acres total in all of the Tomic 
backyard. It's actually the largest redevelopment site at this point in Alexandria as far as land mass is concerned. And as the city manager said, there are also a number of benefits um, and infrastructure improvements that we are getting, that the city is getting as a result of this. Um, such things as, as you can see from this picture right here, the Route 1 bridge, the Monroe Avenue uh, bridge straightening, um, a potential new uh, city school site, a fire station, affordable housing, um, more parks and recreational facilities than I can begin to list here, sewer and stormwater improvements, and of course a multimodal, a vast array, um, really of multimodal transportation improvements. Um, connectivity, so I'm really just going to touch on a couple of things. You, you've all um, been familiar with the development of Potomac Yard as we've been going on, but there's a couple of things that are of particular interest right now. One of them is connectivity. We've heard a lot um, about the connecting streets into the neighborhoods, and I just wanted to show you this graphic to remind you where those streets are. The connectivity is incredibly important, not just so that people in Potomac Yard are connected to the city, but so that people in the adjoining neighborhoods can actually access the parks and the retail and the other amenities in the public yard. Um, and some of these streets are not complete yet, or they're not open yet, but they will be <coughs> in the future development. For development context, so this sort of just shows the ownership of all the pieces of the public yard. Um, it also, it's, it, it, one of the things that is very fortunate about this is that there are so few owners, and that allows us to do a better job of coordinating and the graphic also shows you the phasing, that different colors represent different phases as well as different colors. Okay, so one of the biggest site constraints that we have, and this really affects the location of the metro station, is the glide path for National Airport. What this indicates is that there are constraints on the height um, that uh, have a big impact on design. And normally, in a coordinated development district, which this is, uh, one of the benefits is you can move the height and density around, um, and uh, so you have a lot of flexibility. That's less true here because of the constraints on the glide path for um, the, the National Airport. And as a result, what happens is when you are a land bank G, um, and the height limit is about 110 feet. Um, development activity. So this is also, this is where we're going to start out the driving south and what you'll see is is that most of those land base G, H, I, J, and L are either um, in have either are in some form of approval or are actually under construction. Um, and uh, except for the two blocks in the center, the two white blocks which are reserved for a possible GSA tenant and multi family, um, everything else uh, oh yeah, everything else is either under construction or has been approved. Um, let me just go back a second. The other thing I just wanted to point out, the, the, this southern part of the um, of Potomac Yard will be, uh, in about two years, 50% of it will be complete. So as, you, as we take you on the bus tour today, you'll see how rapidly things are uh, coming up out of the ground, and then in another couple of years, it'll be half of it will be physically complete. Mm. So the land use and metro alternatives, as you can see, there's three metro locations. One is, is, is the A, which was the original location proved many years ago. One is B, and the, then there's alternative D. Um, this graphic is important because it shows you the relationships of the potential metro stations to the potential height. And what you can see here is that alternative A um, is actually it's close to, the, to where we are now. Um, uh, is very constrained. So the idea here is that you want to have the metro station serve as many people as possible. Um, in order to do that, you have to put people within a quarter mile radius for walking. A half mile radius is okay. Um, quarter is better. But after a half mile, um, people the ridership falls off precipitously. So it really does actually make a big difference. And the other thing that you want to think about when you're locating the metro station is you want to be able to use it as an attractor for office uses. It actually has an impact on the uses. People who are building new office buildings want a metro station and they want urban amenities. So that's what they're going to be looking for. And locating the metro station in the right place is an opportunity to attract additional office uses. Um, 
And this basically goes back to the 2008. The first time we uh, talked about the location for our metro station was in the 2008 Transportation Master Plan. We've been through a series of processes, and now we're up in the environmental impact statement. And that's where we are really looking at the details of where the metro station is going to be located. You'll hear a lot more about the three locations as we take the tour today. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim Spang to talk about this. <coughs> Yeah, uh, important for any community is high quality open space. And you will see that on the bus tour today. This is a coordinated and connected community <coughs> of green spaces uh, connecting on the south to Braddock Road, uh, Braddock Metro, uh, GW Middle School, and on the north, the four mile run. And if you four mile run, you can get to uh, the GW Parkway Trail or the WOMD Trail. So, You've got actually, from this point, hundreds of miles of biking and running uh, to do in the region. Uh, it's a system of linear parks and smaller neighborhood parks that connect to allow uh, um, recreation right outside your home or at larger spaces uh, to go to. The largest park, uh, Potomac Guard Park, 24 acres from the south side, which is where the 11 is uh, on that end. That's the south side. The other pond, the north end, that's a mile uh, in terms of distance. Its widest point is 200 feet, narrowest point uh, approximately 30 feet. Uh, in this, you have uh, active uh, recreation activities, which are tennis, basketball, volleyball, universal uh, uh, playground with the interactive water feature uh, and special event space uh, uh, for the community. That's my two slides. <laughs> <laughs> Rich Bear, who has at least 100 slides. <laughs> Quick question. Um, you just said, in terms of describing all that, you said, quote, for the community. But for that part, this is for the entire city of All right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's no exaggeration, right? Um, very quickly, uh, the metro station has been talked about. Um, the Farrell mentioned that it really was a part of the 2008 master plan when it came into really some sort of standing. Um, it's it's a project that has been uh, put on the table because it really relieves uh, about the 10,000 trips that are expected to come down Route 1 um, in the coming years, not just as a part of this development, of course, but also because, because of a part of the region that we are and the growth around us. Um, it also, for these reasons, um, as Carol mentioned, it is an important part of the land use process. Every single investment that we make as far as transportation, we look at it as really both being not just an infrastructure improvement, but also an economic development uh, tool. Where we are, uh, this is a, a rather long process, and we're right here at the end of 2013. Um, later in the spring, we expect to bring forward uh, a decision to council, which may be to uh, not build a metro, it may be to build a metro at one of three locations. Um, we are really pacing ourselves and we're looking at many different options. As you'll see and reflect when you go out in the field on the buses, you will see that there are many sort of contextual issues that we need to address. Uh, none of these are the George Washington Memorial Parkway impact aesthetics and views. Uh, we also have a number of residential issues as we have existing residential uses that are very proximate. And then Farrell's touched on some of the other issues as part of the Potomac Yard planning. Um, so later in the spring, uh, early summer, we expect to bring a council uh, decision back to them insofar as consideration of a preferred alternative. Let me just go back just real quick. Um, I just want to touch on, we've talked about this many times. You can see uh, the different, as you're out there, think about the different sort of impacts and then think of also uh, the different cost levels. Um, certainly alternative D, you can see, is the most expensive, and that is the one that is really, that is in the yard itself on the west part of the tracks. These are the different locations. This won't mean much to you. You've seen this over and over. But again, when you're out there, take a look at um, the number of issues and part of the EIS process, the problem impact study process that's very, very important is for us with our federal partners, uh, FDA, NPS, and WMATA, Take a look at all of those environmental, social, um, economic, financial issues and to see if they can all be addressed and how they can be balanced or if they can be balanced.
just want to touch on the transit of the way itself. Uh, as you'll notice, we'll drive by and we won't stop. The transit way is about 85% complete. Um, the transit way itself, you'll see uh, evoke sort of the history as you move through the yard. You'll notice that all of our transportation elements, as well as the streets themselves, all touch on our rich transportation history. Um, this transit way is a 0 0.87 uh, quarter uh, on Route 1 and off of Route 1. On Route 1 in, uh, in dedicated lanes in the middle. Uh, we're very pleased to have been working with Potomac Yard itself the provision of uh, design and also the right of way itself. Uh, a very important piece, we're looking at late summer, uh, I'm sorry, early summer, late spring for the opening of the transit. And I think what you'll see is it'll be very different, the first in the region to offer amenities similar to rail, but not be uh, laden with the cost of rail. And we're gonna look at rail as an alternative later on, but this transit way really offers people uh, a way to get a sub-regional fashion from Arlington all the way down to uh, Braddock Road Metro to move throughout the city. It helps to connect both uh, Delray and also the yard and puts people in touch with, if you will, um, what they want, which is very transit-rich, transportation-rich sort of place. I just wanted to touch on just for a second, um, there, there are several pieces of infrastructure you normally wouldn't think of. Uh, the, the uh, intersecting line itself for sewage was a very, very big project, tens of millions of dollars. It was completed just about a decade ago. Um, working with uh, Potomac Yard, multi Centex, we were able to, to get a, a project that not only helps us with future CSO issues by allowing us to use a, a name, if you will, for sewage conveyance all the way down to the treatment plant. A big, big project. And Farrell mentioned the Monroe New Bridge, uh, done with a lot of design input from the community and completed um, just about five and a half years ago. So with that, um, I think we are just ready to I think we actually are ready to leave. Go out to the buses. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Let me just thank, let me thank Steve Collins for being our host today. So thank you, Steve. And so before we get started, um, just to talk a little bit about context. As Farrell mentioned earlier, the size of Potomac Yard, 230 acres. Uh, to put that in a little bit of context of how big Potomac Yard is, Carlisle, the built portion of Carlisle, is about 70 acres. So it gives you some scale of how large this site is in the city. Uh, to me, the other interesting thing, we're, we're talking about the metro today, but think about Potomac Yard and the history of transportation here. It's really been Route 1, a canal, railroads, and now we're talking about a metro station. So transportation has been a big component of everything that's really happened in Potomac Yard. And you're going to see some of that history reflected. Um, we should, uh, can everyone hear me, by the way? I'm trying not to use the mic. Um, so the street that we are on right now is Mainline Boulevard. This is a street that really is a spine road that connects North Potomac Yard. And you have, hopefully everyone has the handouts as well. Um, this is a, a road that connects really North Potomac Yard and it goes all the way down to essentially almost the Braddock Metro. And as we're moving through the constructed portion of Potomac Yard, you see on your left one of the neighborhood parks. You see some of the townhouse development. Uh, and what's interesting, I was just talking to uh, PYD this morning, a lot of the multifamily building is actually starting construction as well. The new giant in Lambay G, and we're going to see that as we come around Potomac Yard. And one of the things you see, sort of street dimensions, this are, are very typical of Old Town, 66 feet wide, sidewalks. And as we move through Potomac Yard, it's hard to envision now, but each of these neighborhoods are going to have different characters, architecturally. and. Um, and uh, let me just sort of allow Rich to talk a little bit about context as well. I, I just wanted to mention that as we pass these framework streets that are intersecting with Mainline and some of them Potomac Avenue, it's real important to realize that we have five framework streets and as part of the overall design and the traffic studies, we actually are looking at not just this side of Potomac Yard, but we're looking at Del Rey and how the intersecting streets are going to change and possibly carry more traffic. So we've been working with the community based on on those characteristics and recognize many issues. You want to look apart, so. One of the things about the framework connections that we're talking about here is also open space. You'll see that this is one of the linear parks that connects Delray to Potomac Yard Park on the other side. So this is one of those green connections. It's 
attachment to be more pedestrian friendly um, and include some of these things into the larger open space network. Yeah, that's a very good point. If you look at that overall plan, you can <coughs> If you look at that overall plan, all of those framework streets have these sort of greenways, which reinforce that connection to Land Bank Head, because as Jim talked about in the presentation, these are all public parks, either through easement or dedication. Now, as we move through the yard, just what you don't see is that intercept line, what we talked about before, which is very important because that's going to play a key role in the city's combined sewer separation, allowing us to, in Old Town, connect on to that and that was provided by the developer, and it's about 30% larger than the pipe would have been just for the developer's flow. Yeah. One of the things that I, I've had a lot of questions about what are heights, what are scale, what are some of these buildings that are coming online? There's a three-dimensional graphic in your packet. Essentially, most of the heights where we are today, I'm going to say 40 to 60 feet. Uh, there's a new multifamily building coming online at Potomac and Route 1. That's probably 60, 65 <coughs> feet, Steve or Kathy. Um, and essentially, it steps up towards Land Bay G and Land Bay F, just to give you some context of what will be here in the future. And you have some elevations and images in your packet. So, as we move down here, you'll see how Main Line is going to cross over Potomac and connects on to Monroe Avenue. Um, we're actually going to go right here down beneath the Monroe Avenue Bridge. On the right, you'll see the stormwater retention pond. Um, this is part of, again, an infrastructure system that you wouldn't think is all accommodating both Potomac Yard, either stormwater runoff, sewage we talked about for the sewer interceptor, and the traffic regionally, um, a $50 million investment back in 2005, six. The, the south pond that we have here, which is located off your side, this is also part of Potomac Yard Park. It's one of two stormwater ponds that we have in the park, and it's been designed um, to include a lot of different features, and include it beyond doing just the stormwater management treatment that it's, it's working with, um, it's also trying to create park space. It's designed with an Ian Ambler um, stormwater treatment facility, which uses suction and water flow to pull a lot of the nutrients through a vegetated filter system, so it's using more of regular biology to try to do some of this filtration instead of using some of the mechanical systems that have been relied on in the past. <coughs> on your right-hand side is a new multifamily building. You have some images in your packet. Um, obviously, it's moving forward with construction. The frontage on Monroe Avenue is going to have ground floor retail which is going to be adjacent to the coffee shop, uh, which we also hope will serve some of the parks uh, which are completed across the street. The other thing that we're going to see as we turn right into some of the new street on your left is going to be uh, townhouses, uh, and we're going to go back and look at the substation and relationship to the community because we've heard from some of you the importance of connectivity. <coughs> about 14, 13 point, so it's total, that's with North Potomac Yard, with the Metro. So just to clarify, that's all of the yard. Oh, this is a lot less dense. Yeah, this is less dense. Anyway, the other question I had was, um, uh, when we had visited the firehouse, uh, the firehouse uh, was visited the firehouse sometime ago, uh, one of the comments that had been made by one of the firemen, and I don't know if spoke for everybody, The question was relating to the firewalls in the individual buildings that came up a couple years ago. And code administration actually, based on that question and several others, they, they continue to look at the code that everything in here meets or exceeds the building code. 
So, yeah, we're very comfortable. We trust it's a tough building. We know it is. It's done by Alexandria. Can I have one more? <laughs> <laughs> I ran everything that you had here, every page, including blank pages. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I just have to say, Jeff, it's been substation is a Dominion Power substation uh, which is under construction this is the architectural screening of that substation and one of the things we wanted to point out is this street will ultimately connect to Leslie and Nelson um, it we're talking with Dominion Power about what and how that connection would be but that would continue straight to Leslie one of the things that we're talking as we're talking about this particular organization of things between this multifamily building and the substation will be um, a dog park when we're talking about open space needs that are still very prevalent this is almost an acre it's 0.9 acres of open space that's for this dog park and that will be open to the full community and, and you know one of the things we discovered in uh, the west end is how important those dog parks are they're not just uh, Small amenities, they're major because you've got all these uh, 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 high rises and uh, multi family homes, and there's no place to walk your dog. So, if you have the dog parks, it's also a social setting. Too. You can see here the off, oh, I'm sorry, you can see here the opportunities for connection, and the plan basically looks at both opportunities for pedestrian and perhaps even cyclists and vehicular as well. In Glendale. The streets will continue a little bit farther south, but at this time they're not paved and so the bus can't go on them. There'll be another loop worth of, of roads. Um, but as we're coming back to South Main Line Boulevard here, you'll see this is the south tail connection of Potomac Yard Park. So this is the trail piece that Jim was talking about earlier in the presentation. It's about 30 to 40 feet wide. It's very small, uh, but it's very important because it creates that uh, multi-use trail between Braddock all the way up to Monroe, which will then connect into the rest of the park. Um, along this trail, there's a vegetative screening buffer, which helps to create some kind of noise, a visual buffer from the trains to both the development and the park itself. And there's also fitness stations located along the trail here, so that if um, we're able to accommodate some kind of exercise stations, that would be in this location. As we go up under the bridge, Potomac Yard Park has been constructed in several phases, and you'll see the two fields which were constructed as a, the first phase of Potomac Yard Park. The whole park, um, as Jim mentioned, is about 24 acres in size, and Potomac Yard um, is in charge of all the construction, and they'll be dedicating it to the city once it's complete, sort of in phase process. Uh, we hope that the first phase, which is the main body, will be the online, hopefully this fall, um, and the trail connection, which we're passing now, next year sometime, um, as they make that connection down to Braddock. The park is the main open space for the entire Potomac Yard development, and it includes a lot of different features. Um, in addition to the active recreation that we're going to kind of get a glimpse of as you look through, actually there's some soccer practice or soccer games going on, you can see that already being used. Um, there's a lot of interpretive features 
We talked about the history of Potomac Yard and a lot of these historical features have been brought into the park. You'll see the riprap jump. Sorry. Um, can you hear me at all in the back? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Um, you'll see a lot of this um, striping and striations of different pavements and things here in the park. That's meant to mimic the rail patterns. You'll see that down here in the riprap here in the South Pond, all of the pathways and sidewalks, you'll see them angling off in different ways as we go by the park. That's also actually in the exact locations where tracks used to be. So we overlaid pathways and organizing the different features of the parks based off of what used to be there. This section here was a piece that we worked on with um, the Office of Historic Alexandria. It's meant to mimic that sorting station. When trains came into the yard, they were sorted and all the cars were dispersed and organized into new trains. And so they used topography to do that. And that's what this landform is supposed to kind of mimic. Um, as we move through, you'll see other historic pieces, um, including the old canal used to run through this part of the park. So you'll see there's a feature there that has a little bit of a bridge and some paving that mimics a little bit of water. Um, there's a lot of different pieces which create a lot of the infrastructure here for Potomac Yard Park. That's awful subtle. I hope that you've got a, I mean, that's a stretch. It's abstract. So, it is. Uh, it's I think it's if, you're, if you're really doing that, you better put a sign up that says what it's supposed to be mimicking. We are on target with that. Oh, okay. Uh, um, the, 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 the park space, does that help us towards our open space? Uh, it's already been it's already been counted within the the goal because okay. it's been promised um, and it's under construction now. Yeah. I guess it was open space before, but not it's not, <laughs> not quite the same open yeah. space. Um, you'll see we're going by the active courts now. We've got volleyball, basketball, tennis courts. Um, being one of the smallest portions of the park, it was really easy to put in some of this active recreation. As um, Rich mentioned earlier, this is the pump station, um, which helps to do with that sanitary need here in the Potomac Yard Park. Um, Another one of the infrastructure pieces is the stormwater facilities. We talked about the ponds a little bit earlier. There's also a number of what we call bay saver filtration units, which are underground and they sit underneath the main promenade in the park. We have an 18 foot wide um, promenade, which is a paved surface meant to be the big spine, if you will, of the park. So as we go by the tracks, these are the, the CSX tracks. On the other side, you'll see that we have actually the WMATA rail tracks. And so we're trying to give you a proximity, a base of comparison from where we are on the street to where we're coming up to the locations that possibly a metro could be. You get a relationship to what the tracks are, where they are, the housing, the existing housing, all the infrastructure. So keep in mind as we're talking about that metro alternative, you need to cross CSX to get to the metro tracks. The, the other thing I would just mention is we're looking at the metro location when we stop. Okay. Look, look back both north and south of planned development and existing constructed development. Because as Farrell indicated, balancing land use and transportation and where is that best alternative. And as you look north to alternative D when we get up there, you'll see the sign will point it out. Bear in mind that's about 50 feet in height. So it's, it's quite high, about four and a half stories in height. Um, the other metro station locations that are proposed are uh, about 10 or so feet lower because of topography. All right, you'll see we're going by the playground right now. Jim mentioned this is a universally accessible playground. Um, fully, it will be fully open when the park comes open. And it's also got the interactive water feature in the middle of two portions, one for two to five year olds and the second portion for five to 12 year old kids um, with age appropriate playground equipment. Now, we're hoping to open it this fall. Hiking um, They're really moving through the construction, and we're hoping to be able to open it up to the public. Okay. Great. Now, we're, we're getting ready to get off. I want to remind everybody that this is an active construction site, so please be aware of your surroundings. Um, please stay on the pavement, especially because some of the sod was just very recently laid. Um, we want to make sure that we're not damaging any of the vegetation. And um, we're going to go and have a, a brief stop here in the park, and then we'll get back on the bus. Right, we'll get back on the bus. This is not where the corner or the end of Alternative A will be the south end. It will be across the CSX line and then across that vegetated area um, over on that side, closer to Potomac uh, Greens. And this is one of the things that we were talking about earlier, one of the contextual things that we need to take into account with regard to the DEIS. Uh, speaking about the, the relationship of it with Potomac Greens, the noise, the siding, the Potomac um, River, 
the, G the George Washington Memorial Parkway, all of those issues. If you look further to the north, um, the platforms are about 750 feet in length, 600 feet of platform, and then when you put the all the supporting elements on about 750, that is the um, end of uh, Alternative B, and that, of course, as well, is over on the other side of the two rail lines. So one set of rail lines right here, CSX, and then across the vegetation. And then Alternative D, very far north, and that is the... That's the south end, isn't it? Yeah. So that's actually the south end. So that would be another 750 feet further to the north. And so we'll drive by those locations, and you can notice uh, you can notice that uh, one of the things also to keep in mind that we were talking about a little bit on our bus is the fact that each of the heights are being taken into consideration, how we can minimize those. Of course, Alternative D is the highest, both from a topographic standpoint, also because it's more of a, um, I hate to say a, a Tyson's, but more of a Tyson's type station, very large, about 50 feet, so about four and a half stories. Um, the other two uh, range somewhat less than that in height uh, because of the topography, and so you, you can see that in your handout packages. With with both A and B, we are looking at the siting of a pedestrian bridge. Um, of course, we have to have a pedestrian walkway over both sets of rails. That's one of the height challenges, the vertical issues that we have clearing uh, both sets of rail. Uh, we're working with both the uh, National Park Service and our federal partners, WMATA as well, to make sure that both from a horizontal a track perspective and a vertical perspective, we're trying to make sure that we impact as little as possible of the fee simple uh, National Park Service property as well as the scenic easement. Um, also of concern is how the noise will be mitigated because understanding that any sort of metro location um, and part of the DEIS is a noise and a social impact as far as the quality of life. Jeff has right here um, a couple uh, of well, we were, oh, and Emily and Lee uh, will pass these around. You can all come up. Uh, these show the actual locations. Uh, they show the uh, actual platform length and the relationship one to another of the different locations as well as to Potomac Greens and this park. Um, so we'll pass these around uh, while we're out here. Um, also just want to make sure that people um, are aware, again, um, that part of the DEIS process is a consideration of a no-build alternative as well. Rich, I just wanted to mention, um, I'm sorry. Just, just wanted to mention very quickly, we've talked about distances with each of these alternatives, and what you see on these graphics is north to north, A to B, is about 950 feet. So that's about four, three to four city blocks. Uh, and then you can see that alternative D is 400 feet farther north than that. And I think, as we all know, one of the challenges is, is how do we put this near the planned density particularly given some of the FAA limitations. So we're going to talk about some of that more in the buses as well. And Jeff, which one was the preferred site? The, the discussion, yeah. During the North Potomac Arts Mario plan process, we were looking at alternative B. Um, and that was obviously one of the options that we looked at to put density, uh, the metro near density, with the understanding that we had to go through the EIS. Yeah, the preliminary alternative. If there's a no-build, where would the pedestrian bridges be? Yeah. We, there, there are a couple locations uh, that have been identified, both on the east and west side, uh, but that's something that would meet, need to go back to City Council for the final location and the Planning Commission. The planning commission. Mm -hmm. Are we going to drive through Potomac Greens to show where no. it would be over there? No. We are not. Unfortunately, it was just timing um, because I think that is an important relationship and. And for those of you who are interested, please look at that uh, east side. There's yeah. a sign over there, too. Yeah. There is a sign. Yeah. yeah, I was told there's a sign over there as well, Ton. Yeah. Do we want to walk a little bit? Yeah. We want to counsel for questions. Lots of questions. Why is D have? Yes, sir. Why is D 50 feet? Why, why is there such higher, such higher elevation on D than, than the others? Topography wise, D is a surface station, and so as a surface station, you can see the topography here is much higher than on the rail lines, and then also you also have that vertical aspect we talked about crossing over the rail track. So it's a topography and a vertical clearance issue going over both rail lines. Do the council members have any questions?
one. Um, my uh, bus, there was a question about uh, requirement for affordable housing, and um, there is no percentage requirement or goal for affordable housing in this development. Um, when the development was being vision and evolving and everything, there was a commitment on the part of the developer to put as much affordable housing, um, uh, to identify as much affordable housing as possible. And um, what was really going to happen was that if they, whatever they didn't build, they were going to make a cash contribution to the city's affordable housing fund, which was going to be roughly almost $10 million. And so as a result of the need to have a fire station in this new planned community, um, the the, added, the, the direction shifted from, well, if we got to build a fire station, we can't do affordable housing. And I stopped that immediately mm -hmm. by saying, well, we can do both. We can do a fire station and we can do affordable housing. So with the new fire station over here to the to my, to my left, um, you, we have 64 units of workforce and affordable housing units incorporated into that development there. But as other development with residential occurs throughout the whole project here, um, whether it's a hundred units of you know rental or con whatever it is, um, we will the housing office and the staff said they will be working with the developers to say, well, can you give us two units here? Can you give us five there? So that's how we're going to be able to address to get more affordable units within the total development. But there is no set goal that says you know it's got to be 10 percent or 20 percent or anything along those lines. Walking north, we're going to take a step on the trail. Yeah. So a very good, a good opportunity to get that perspective of how a metro and the crossings would actually interact with the existing rail lines. Mm -hmm. um, Mark just mentioned uh, th there's a requirement for for frail rate um, 22 feet, and so we've got to make sure that we clear that. We're working on some um, some designs that actually would minimize a traditional crossing, enable it to be ADA compliant, but also. Uh, have a minimum vertical profile. So it's one of the things that we're actually trying to do as we lay out this design as well as looking at the track, the tracks themselves and other issues associated with uh, the provision of rail transport um, on both uh, sets of lines to make sure again we're minimizing the impact to the National Park Service property both fee simple and the scenic easement. What, what's, what are we the up to now? what's the distance between here and the... Where's Lee? What is the distance exactly? Yeah, yeah Lee, what's the distance across? Uh, about 200, 250 feet. So the distance across um, for the pedestrian for the crossing is about 250 feet over both sets of rail lines. What are we up to now uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the alternatives? Where are we? Um, we uh, uh, if you look to the north, we're, we're kind of right on the B platform. No, we're on A. No, we're on A. We're on a. We're on a. I'm sorry, yeah, we're on A. I'm sorry, we're on A. There's the B, and the next one far up is D. We're in the middle of A. This is like right. the middle of A. Yeah. So the A platform, remember, um, the platform itself is about 600 feet, and then you've got the accoutrements on either end, about a total of 750. The uh, question, we had also had a question on the financing of the station. The three, al the three alternatives, you've got the prices in one of your handouts, A being the uh, cheapest, A being the cheapest alternative, uh, and then B slightly above that, and then D is almost double the other two. D is double the other two, almost half a billion dollars, because of the fact you have to, to it's, in, it, it's in the air. It's like what you see, it, as Rich said it earlier in Tyson's, and uh, it is six story, It is about six stories in the air. And so because it has to cross the CSX, to get over here, it has to cross the CSX tracks 22 feet above that at least. And then because of the geometrics of how Metro and any rail system has to have very gradual curves and gradual ups and downs, it basically stays aerial the whole distance of Potomac Yard, so it's got to build, you have to build bridges, you've got to do... Okay. With D, you've got to build bridges, and it's a very, a very expensive option, and, and frankly, based upon the uh, economics and, and the tax revenue generation estimates that we did when we did the uh, North Potomac Yard plan, uh, it's it's probably outside the, the realm of what's uh, financially feasible. So what is likely to be in the realm of financially feasible is going to be alternative A and B. And it's part of the EIS process when we get into... The, you can point the, out the metro. Yeah, you can see the metro. That's at some point, you an idea exactly where it is. We planned it like this. Yeah. <laughs> so 
that's where the station would be. Yeah. So the station would be on either at, uh, on either side. It'd be the design of the station would be a platform on either side of the of the two rail tracks down down the middle. Uh, the uh, financing of the uh, of the stations, uh, the financial plans are to basically use tax revenues that are generated in Potomac Yard uh, to to pay for the station, uh, and that would be the tax revenues to continue to grow. In addition, there are two special tax districts that were created. One in North Potomac Yard adds 20 cents onto the tax bills at basically the retail center uh, property, and that's already started. We've already been collecting that money for a couple of years. And the second tax district is a is at a lower rate at 10 cents added on to your normal real estate tax bill, and that's for the southern end of Potomac Yard, uh, and that will not uh, go into its. In, it's a city ordinance already, but it doesn't kick in and become effective until the calendar year after after the station opens. As part of the EIS process, we'll be going back through and uh, looking at all the economics and reprojecting all the numbers to determine uh, what, in a sense, is financially feasible and what, in a sense, is not financially feasible. And one of the challenges that uh, we've had in this whole process is that while the federal uh, government paid anywhere between 70 66 percent and 80 percent of the metro system when it was built was paid by the federal government when the new york avenue infill station was built the federal government kicked in one third of it uh, the problem we have now is with federal earmarks no longer no longer possible and we're just kind of general uh, the fact this is an infill station on an existing line uh, federal funding as far as grant funding is concerned really is not it is, is really not in the cards for the, the metro rail station we may be able to uh, use borrow money from the federal government through the federal what's called TIFIA uh, loans, and that would enable us not to have to use entirely city general obligation bonds to do the debt financing. But a uh, more flexible financing is available to the federal government, but that's competitive and that's not a certainty. But that's one area we'll explore to both help us with cost and help us with uh, the flexibility in regards to repayment. In regards to uh, state state assistance, there may be some possibility of getting some state or regional transportation assistance to help. But that that is something that we'll, we'll be looking at as we move uh, forward. But we, when we did the projections of the metro stations, we wanted to say, can we do this without any assistance from anybody else using the tax revenues uh, from Potomac Yard? And the answer and the answer was when we did uh, the North Potomac Yard plan and was looked at the B alternative, which really created the B alternative. The answer was almost, and uh, it became a yes once when we negotiated for the developer in North Potomac Yard. If it's an alternative B, then the developer uh, would kick in $10 a square foot, uh, $50 million, also provide a shortfall uh, guarantee of $32 million uh, in the early years of the plan uh, for alternative B. That developer, though, believes that alternative A doesn't do them any good in regards to the value of what it does to their development and so they basically said the 50 million dollars applies to only B. That's all we were able to get them. D we haven't negotiated with them because uh, that was a later alternative and uh, as I said again it's, it's, a, it's, it's another 200 million dollars that has to be covered. It takes uh, away uh, developable property and so that's an alternative that is frankly being studied because the EIS process says we have to study it but I don't think if, if someone was going to put money down on A, B, or D, I don't think there, there'd be many of us who'd probably be putting, saying that we'd bet on D. Councilman Smedrick. Can you touch a little bit on the uh, issues, the park service, and some of that uh, issues that you have in Okay. Um, alternative A is on a reserve, is on a reserve, is on a reserve site, basically that was designated uh, in, 19, in 1999 uh, when Potomac Greens was, was, was approved. Uh, alternative B is further north. Uh, it has uh, uh, there's a scenic easement that was put in place in 1999. Uh, it was basically an agreement between the Park Service, uh, the developer, and Arlington County. It uh, did a number of things. One of which put it, it put the scenic easement on this property down here in Alexandria. It allowed it took basically allowed then took the scenic easement off of development property in Arlington and some of those buildings that you that you can see standing here that have subsequently been built since 1999 were allowed because of the, the switching of kind of where the easements were. 
Um, in addition, the agreement, one of the issues to the city over the years had been any access from the GW Parkway, and that agreement also said there can be basically no uh, permanent access, vehicular access, uh, to the GW Parkway from, from Potomac Greens. So that was put in place in 1999. Uh, alternative B, some of Alternative B is in that scenic easement. That's an issue that, we, that we're having to deal with. Uh, the, in addition, uh, Alternative B requires, uh, based on the current uh, design speed of the Metro Rail system, uh, basically requires the, the uh, part of the Park Service property, uh, a strip really from about four mile run to uh, down into, down into uh, a little area a little bit to our north. Looks like a suspicious demonstration, I guess. But it's harder to drill at National so, Airport. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, so one of the things that's being looked at at the request of the Park Service is basically uh, how can we not be in the scenic easement? How can we uh, basically, uh, probably most importantly, uh, not require the, the use of Park Service actually Park Service owned property? The scenic easement is on city owned property. It's not Park Service property. Uh, but it's the Park Service property that's fee simple, that's very problematic, and so the Park Service is, is basically asked looking at alternatives. And two alternatives that you may have uh, heard that are uh, we're looking at, one is to basically uh, change the design speed of the rail tracks so you don't have to move them over into the Park Service property. The mayor's calling him and telling him it's okay. Okay, maybe we pass muster. Um, okay, so by changing the design speed, which is something Metro's looking at, it's not something they typically, they typically do, then that potentially could mean we wouldn't have to change the tracks. That's, that could potentially then solve the simple problem. Uh, the second issue, the scenic easement, is more problematic, and the Park Service has asked us to look to, to see whether or not it'd be possible, uh, both in this case possible is not only engineering wise uh, but uh, financially to move the CSX tracks uh, a bit further west uh, to provide more room on the other side of the CSX tracks for uh, alternative B. Um, just, just two quick just two quick points. Kind of squeeze it. You gotta squeeze it. Squeeze it. Just two quick points. Um, some of you have asked what's going to happen to the retail in the shopping center now that's on what we call Land Bay F, which is slated for future redevelopment. That retail will stay there, not in its current form, but as part of the redevelopment scenario. Um, and the redevelopment includes a series of mixed use, both residential and office buildings and a cluster of retail, in fact a little bit more retail than is there now is what's planned for the future. So um, it may not be all the same stores, but we understand the intent is to keep the target and some of the other ones as well. So that's, that's good news for us. The second question is, um, will the, if we don't build a metro station, what will be the effect on the d amount of development that's approved? And the answer is it will have an extreme effect the amount of development would likely be reduced, re reduced by maybe half, but in any case we would have to do a replanning effort before the final number was determined, and that could have a big, that could be represent a major change to what's what we what we've approved so far. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. The, the development we would lose is the key commercial development. It's yes. So the, absolutely, and we would definitely, as I was saying earlier, one of the big things about a metro station is that it attracts office people want to locate new offices where there's metro stations and urban amenities, that would not occur if we didn't have a metro station. So it would not only change the amount of development, it would have a big impact on the kind of uses that we could attract. And now we need to walk back to the buses. And now we need to walk back to the buses. As we continue to go along, we did skip one piece in the interest of time as we were um, at the stop. I wanted to just touch base a little bit on the plaza space at Swan Avenue. Um, there in the park, that's the widest part of the park. It's 200 feet across between the tracks here in Potomac Avenue, and that's the major event space that's planned for the yard. There's a stage, as you saw, with the interpretive feature of the, the rail pattern down into the stage. 
and um, that's where we could have art festival pieces, performances, things like that. Uh, it's also the widest part of the, the lawn area, which we can also use for, you know, your regular people who want to throw a frisbee around and things like that, because most of the park is too narrow for that. Um, there, where we're at the widest point, that 200 feet, that's really where the heart of the park is. I just wanted to point out as we're driving, we're going to come up on the northern portion of A, which is the uh, uh, A alternative. So that's going to be on your right, which are the sandbags. It's probably the easiest place to spot it initially. The and white sandbags. The, the white sandbags. Oh, yeah, a sign there. And you see the sign above it. So that's this is the northern portion of A. Yeah, and, and then also on your left, think about what's going to be there in the future from a development land use perspective. And what, what is the construction? Right yeah, so the construction on your left is really all the new multifamily building uh, in uh, G. To the right of the fire station is the new Giant, which just started this week. So I think a lot of people are hopefully excited about that to get a new urban grocery store. Uh, so there's a lot of development going in G. And as Farrell indicated, this is about the location of that FAA glide path that we talked about. We're sort of almost right under that glide path. Yeah, and alternative B, the southern end, we just passed, which you can probably see in the back of the bus. Yeah. because th this is something we get a lot of questions on and it's hard to locate yourself in the yard because you don't have buildings but I'm um, sort of in the center behind target on your left if you go straight back towards Potomac you're sort of in the middle of D and you're on the northern portion of B um, and probably the end of the fire station is the beginning of B is sort of a place to think about where's B and then uh, sort of between the park that's existing in Potomac Greens, if you go over there, really almost to their community center, that's A. Just as a way to think about this, and this will be on our website. I was just told this is on our website, so if you have questions, we have this available as well. Did you say you're just starting to negotiate the D, the D dog options with the Calvary? We're, no, we're, we're actually not in negotiations with the developer at all on any of the alternatives right now. What we're doing is, as part of the draft environmental impact study, is we're looking at the impacts, social, environmental, financial, on all of the alternatives and comparing them one to another. So D is an alternative that came out of the community process, the scoping process, which is the first phase of the DEIS. So it's being considered like all the rest. There is no discussion going on with the developer or any developer team for part of D or any of the alternatives. Um, alternative B, actually, there is a developer agreement for roughly $50 million of a um, contribution, if you all call it, toward B as in boy. Well, what is B? How you, can you complete the story if you don't know what this developer is going to pay for D, which is closest to their? Development. Wouldn't well, they pay a hundred million dollars? Well, 
uh, actually, um, if we can talk about D for just a second, D actually has probably the greatest impact on a land bay size and type because D is actually within the land bay. Don't forget that alternatives A and B, the markers that you saw here, are over on the other side of the CSX Amtrak rail line. So over on the other side. But D is right here within this land bay. So as part of the DEIS, we're looking at the ability to finance it, but we're not going out and we're not seeking out a memorandum of understanding or an agreement with the developer. So it's D is on their land. D, as in dog, is on their land, right? Completely, 100%. Yes. And there's no easements or anything. It's started from scratch, basically. It would be start from scratch negotiations. D, D would probably be the most intrusive because it would require the greatest amount of land use replanning. It also greatly impacts the park system. Part of it touches the park, as well as the roadway system. So D actually requires almost a total replanning of this surrounding land bay. You want to mention the cost difference. Well, in D, the cost difference is about $200 million D over B. And so that's a big issue. What's the difference? $200 million. Additional. Roughly, roughly an interstate interchange cost, $200 million. Additional. Rich, Rich isn't it? It also requires a lot more aerial alignment through... It requires a lot more aerial alignment. It has a big visual impact on the entirety of the yard because it's very aerial. Don't forget, the topography here is about 15 to 20 feet higher, depending on where you are, than over there. So there's a natural topography rise here. And Rich, just to clarify, it's not exactly 100% on, <coughs> there's a little bit that's on city property, but there's very little that would, that would impact. It's actually sitting here in the park. But again, causes that whole land use replanning, infrastructure park system, and the land bay itself. Questions from council? Well, we can start an eminent domain. <laughs> votes, We're not working money. On it. We don't have the money. <laughs> you may have the votes, but as he says, we don't know about the money. You get a benefactor. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to name the station. That's a lot. I think that's As we come up here, right beside the bus in front of us, you'll see, sir, uh, with the questions about the relationship, you'll see the northern end of B right here. So this is the northern end of B. Yeah, so we're sitting roughly right here. And of course, B is across the CSX, so we couldn't put it there because of the vegetation, but we're roughly sitting, as you can see, Target is behind us, so we're roughly right here. And the, the rationale for looking at B during the North Potomac Yard planning process was, as, we, as Farrell mentioned earlier, we've talked about earlier, we have the FAA glide path, which is here. This area is not limited, uh, at least from the airport perspective, uh, as substantially or as significantly as portions of Land Bay GR. And that was the rationale for, for looking at shifting this station farther north. There must be extreme interest in the stormwater pond up here on the right. The bus in front of us is... Our, is it yourself? Our, our lead bus is having problems. We just go around. <laughs> traffic. That's why we need a metro station. Lots of traffic. Rich, Rich. Hey, Rich. Show me too many people. Our secret way. It's not that secret. It's pretty yeah, sacred. Yeah, yeah, actually, I, the traffic's pretty low on yeah. 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 We'll see if it builds up. I'm going to go to Delray and end up working for this. Well, Dave, and go to the It's all that stuff. It's our revenue. Why are they starting Just the lights. Hopefully, they will come. There's no active plan to keep the geese out. There we go. It's going to be Here's the other pond. So, so, so just to locate yourself, we sort of went from sort of went from Land Bay G. We're now in Land Bay F, and of course, this is Potomac Avenue, that road that extends through all the land bays.
So, so as we come in, you'll see where the footprint is going to be for D. <coughs> Talking about kind of vertical rise, you see how high we are compared to on the other side of the two rail line. And, it, and as we mentioned before, this is an aerial track line here. How, how high? Um, 50, it's, it's like four and a half stories, 50 something feet. And the reason this is aerial track is because it needs to cross CSX, come into Land Bay F, and then come back to the Metro line. So it's 25 feet high, Rich? Roughly 25 feet high would be the station. So it would have aerial tracks through the entire site? Correct. Rich, I noticed that between the the main route as opposed to Main Street. So uh, does that because Main Street is completed or what is this? Oh, it's Potomac Avenue seems to be the Main Street. Well, Potomac Avenue is a four-lane road meant to be the relief valve for Route 1. And so when this was laid out, it was laid out with some traffic calming, but it was meant to be that parallel road to Route 1, Potomac. Main line is that sort of you know, uh, downtown, Main Street, Main Street exactly. more residential parking. What are we doing? This is on your right-hand side. This is the northern portion of D. Which is the graphic method? You want to hold that up just to orient everyone again. So you can see where we are right here. We'll pass this back. The purple with D. So we're sitting right here at the northern end the of D of the actual. It's not anywhere else. It's right here. A 750 foot long track length for D. And and to, 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 to me, what's also interesting is. A was closer to the townhouses, and if you look back, look at where the townhouses are relative to where we are now. It's actually helpful to understand the difference between the various options. So the townhouses on your right are roughly where A is. And so, um, Jeff, you might just want to talk. Yes. Just talk about a little bit about the, the density impacts we talked a little bit about with D. Which page is that? 14. So on page 14, this is something that all of you have in your packet. This is a height graphic, um, and this is essentially, really was the genesis for talking about B, as I indicated in North Potomac Yard, which is putting the metro near the density. Um, outside the obstructions of the adjoining airport, uh, the FAA restrictions, uh, and of course we're at D right now, so we're farther north than B, but this gives you an idea of where townhouses are, where multifamily buildings are, where mid and high rise buildings are. So I think it really gives you a good orientation of the yard. And then on your right-hand side, you also see Potomac Greens. Are there any, any questions while we're waiting? So each of the alternatives has its own set of issues, financial, um, social impacts, CSX, WMATA, rail on each one. And part of the DEIS process is to make sure that each individual alternative is reviewed, then they're compared and contrasted one to another. And so as part of the council discussion that we have, we, we talk about the late spring, early summer, it will be how those different features and the no-bill come out insofar as what the council prioritizes as their main issues to accomplish in getting to a preferred alternative. That preferred alternative is then sent to our federal partners for review and further analysis. We actually balanced that out. One of the things was um, four lanes, but we wanted the traffic to the volume be there, but not fast moving because the setbacks for the residential were only eight to ten feet from the street, and so um, a little bit different than most streets um, in in Old Town, 25 miles an hour. Eisenhower Avenue. Think of how you feel going 35 miles an hour in Eisenhower as you pass um, the. Um, Townhouse next to Towns of Cameron Park. Um, those townhouses, people literally, their front doors are right on the road. Traffic is speeding by. So we looked at a little bit of a difference of 
volume and volume with speed. And so we try to keep it, the design speed is actually at 30 miles an hour and the post speed is five miles per hour less, 25. So how did you explain the no setback on the new buildings coming up on Route 1? Yeah, I, I actually, yeah, I actually think that they're very close. Jeff and I talked about that. Very close. I think yeah, I've talked to Jeff a lot about that. <laughs> so the question was, why isn't there a greater setback or the existing setback uh, on Route One? And I, I think Jeff, if you want to comment, I think they're close. But I, I think the, I think this, yeah, Paul has raised this with me before many times. Uh, uh, the, the buildings that are going up right now are set back about 16 to 17 feet. Uh, a typical sidewalk in Old Town is about 14. They're set back a little bit more. I mean, I understand that it is going to be urban, particularly what's going on out there today. It, I think as buildings are being built and they're in construction sites and they're transforming, I think as buildings come in, they start filling in, it's going to feel like it's part of a bigger neighborhood. I think the challenge right now, particularly with individual buildings, they feel a little isolated. But I think, I think once they start connecting, as you see, particularly around the sales office, I, I think it's going to feel more like a street as opposed to individual buildings. I think but, what it I think what it does point out though is the difficulty of trying to when you have one major arterial and you're trying to build a sort of community consensus, you know, around it and trying to have a sense of community itself. It's very difficult to achieve that when you have a four to six lane roadway. If you consider the turn lanes. Uh, operating by itself as not part of a grid. Yeah, and speaking of a grid, it's probably a good segue to talk about Land Bay F because some of you on this bus were actually in the tour when we were doing North Potomac Yard and we were actually touring South Potomac Yard and you were saying, what is this gonna look like? I just, it feels like a construction site. Here we are only a couple years later and you see the parks, you see the townhouses going in. Land Bay F, and we have some of their property owner representatives on the bus at the end if they answer questions, they're, they have a plan to essentially uh, recreate that street pattern, continue Land Bay K. So as we get up to Four Mile Run, which is another project that we're going to talk about, imagine all of Land Bay K extending, coming up and connecting to Four Mile Run, introducing new street grid, as Farrell indicated, having retail, because that was a big component of the community. We, you know, we wanted retail, we want retail to be here in the future. So imagine this area, perhaps in three to five years, similar to what South Potomac Yard was only a, probably four or five years ago. The, the site that we're going to come up on is actually coming to, I'm sorry, Rich, go ahead. Uh, I just want to point out that the BRT that we're going to see as we loop through Route 1, uh, the BRT will go into Arlington County, as we talked about, on this roadway here in shared traffic, shared traffic lanes. Um, the 0 0.8 section that's out on Route 1 is in dedicated lanes both north and south in the middle of Route 1. And so those lanes will move unimpeded. They'll be open for emergency vehicles out on Route 1 and also for other dash metro uh, transit. And here, interior to the yard, again, working in BRT shared lanes. Until it redevelops. Until it redevelops. And then the plan is it would actually redevelop, just right, out onto Route 1 in front of the big box retail section. Um, Dave. Is this area going to look more or less like the southern end of Christmas City? It's just going to have to be a Much better, I, much better look. I, I, yeah, I, I don't want to comment on Arlington, but I think the intent here was clearly higher density. This is going to be uh, probably the higher density, similar to Carlisle. Um, different architecture, but that scale development. Um, one of, one of the things that we're coming up on, this is actually coming to the Planning Commission City Council in October. This is the, we call it the North Potomac Yard Terminal Station. It's up on your right, and in 1996, this went to council, and there was an expiration of the SUP after 15 years. Um, and basically, it said after 15 years, we want this to go away. And we and Arlington County and WMATA have been working on a way to relocate this facility. Dominion Power has agreed. This is $22 million to relocate this facility and the three associated poles. Because of the change in technology, all of this facility can now be located in the existing facility in Arlington County. Um, now the challenge with doing all that, it displaces the buses and the WMATA bus parking area. 
So we've been working with Land Bay F to locate the buses on Land Bay F. And temporarily. Uh, temporarily. It would probably be for about a year to two years at the most. And I think the other, I'll turn it over to Beth. As we're looking at this area, this is going to be dramatically different. That is four mile run in the open space. So Beth? And you can kind of see out the windows that there's a bridge demolition going on. This is one of the bridges that was designated to come down in the four mile run master plan that was approved by Arlington and Alexandria as a joint project. Um, so we're all very excited and I know Steve Collins is excited to also take the bridge down. Uh, once the bridge is down, that land over there in what we call Land Bay E transfers to the city. And then it will kind of um, be held until North Potomac Yard develops and once that starts going, um, there's a trigger that $8.5 million is given to the city to go ahead and implement some of those plans that were developed with the Four Mile Run Master Plan. I want to tell you, knocking down a bridge, it really uh, takes a lot of power. I tried it and didn't make a You're right. They're built to stand. Well, they are, and apparently you have to have a gas mask. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. Yes. <laughs> Dell, did you want us to get you a hard hat? <laughs> I don't think so. Pay, pay for that in. with the once you the pay for that. Uh, uh, I mean, what is I there in a one of the things we looked at was actually having sort of um, localized, I don't want to say shuttles, but smaller buses, localized shuttles, if you will, that can transfer people around. That's a city-wide concept we need to get into because one of our buses is the size of 40 feet. Way too big for residential streets. But also, when North Potomac Yard yeah, redevelops, yeah, the, the RT will come up to the new street. Yeah, it will come yeah, into yeah. Lambay F and then be able to So, if you're on the BRT, you'll be able to transfer to the Metro. We okay. think probably within a block. Okay. So, here we come up on the, um, the actual, this is the way the BRT will exit from the yard up here as it comes out on Glebe. There's seven transit stations, um, each of the stations. Um, is very high quality and so far as we've worked with Historic Alexandria, Planning and Zoning, and a number of architects on the team, um, I think the stations will be very attractive and both very functional. Um, as you'll see, the BRT will come in and transition into a 0.8 mile dedicated lane facility in the center of Route 1. All envisioned as part of the master plan in 2008 for transportation. Um, in the peak period, there'll be six minute headways, which means that every six minutes, um, you'll have a BRT vehicle, limited stops as I mentioned, seven stop locations um, to pick you up. It'll be the same fare structure as Metro and operated by Metro, and they just went through a branding process, and now it's gonna be called Metro Way. Um, Let me just interject one second. Okay, the new giant that we talked about is right here, actually where the, uh, I think it's where the VACO is located. Uh, so it's right at the intersection of Route 1 and Glee. Sorry. Remember? It's okay. Remind you of square footage. 65,000. It was 65,000. So as you'll see, um, on either side, um, not installed yet, there is the room for a landscape strip. So we've been working with landscape architects, planning and zoning, and parks and rec to have an appropriate landscape strip. <laughs> We're looking at it both as a transportation facility and again to reinforce economic development as a beautification facility as well. Um, as you'll see, as you get down closer to where a station location will be, the transit way itself will change in color and, and to kind of evoke, this is something different for both vehicles and pedestrians, it'll be a sand or tan color. You'll also see projections again, reinforcing the historic rail line transportation perspective. Um, those are in that graphite color projected across the BRT system. Um, what you don't see is at these locations, we'll be putting in closer to the end of the project this spring, uh, we should be putting in pedestrian crossings. These are high emphasis pedestrian crossings, concrete, and they also will be the same color as the transit way itself, thereby uh, denoting a crossing location. Through the landscaping, the monding of the soil, the earth that will be here on either side, and also this high emphasis crossing locations, we hope that pedestrians will afford themselves to cross at the crosswalk. 
Uh, what we are doing is we're trying to do everything that we can to get pedestrians to use the crosswalks and not go mid-block. One of the things that we're most concerned about is safe pedestrian crossings. We provide them and we're trying to encourage everyone to use them. Well, I sat here at this intersection waiting for that arrow to turn green and, and ran it. So, uh, Ooh, that's, is, that's, is that actually right? work? I don't know. It I, yeah, I turned it and it uh, works. It worked. I caught it, it, it works. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have a question? Yeah, in terms of pedestrian crossover with alternatives A, B, and D um, into Potomac Greens, are there various locations suggested for crossover pedestrian bridges at the various A, B, and D? There are illustrative locations, but all those locations need to be determined. We need to work with Parks and Recreation because although it's shown in the park plan to have a landing, we need to work on the design of where it would be depending on which uh, which alternative is chosen. And also, as we mentioned before, we're working with um, the alignment horizontal of the tracks themselves and the track speed. So that's also going to affect where the crossing locations are for pedestrians. Yeah, thank you. There's a shared use trail inside Potomac Yard, as you saw, but there aren't any bike lanes now proposed on Route 1. And you'll notice that um, there's an interim trail that runs on the west side of Potomac Avenue, close to the shopping center, from Glebe all the way up to Four Mile Run. Eventually, when the park redevelops and North Potomac Yard redevelops, we get that last section of Potomac Yard Park. Um, the trail will go on the east side of Potomac Avenue, and you won't ever cross a road all the way from Four Mile Run down to Braddock Road. Is your wife in that crew? Yeah. Is your wife in that line? She took off today. She does Monday, Wednesday, Friday. That, that's not your crew? That no, your they're crew? down in Old Town. <laughs> I run alone. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try it. Yeah, that's my wife does this. It's not today. You gotta run those back. Is that what you're telling us? Recommend that? What? When the light doesn't turn, that you just go through. I was hoping you would never. Kathy, thank you. <laughs> Kathy will hand you the bullhorn. On second thought, they don't need it. I was going to say, please don't. Bullhorn might break. I just want to know what the rules are. I don't know if the sensor's not working. I don't know what it is. Sam broke. Yeah, I don't know. Rich, does it have to be? It worked for me this morning. <laughs> right. Does that voice recognition? Did you take the same uh, executive privilege as the dash cover? Yeah. Drops him off. The city manager comes up past. Just move around. Rich, put your orange black jacket. And draft traffic. Yeah. You wore your red jacket, ma'am. <laughs> Not a problem. Crosses on Route One and run it. Um, will there be going to be right next to the park? Not only to get to the BRT, but to get all the way across. I've just I've noticed down by Target, it's almost impossible to walk from Lynn even over into the Target parking lot. Sure. All right. the basically blocked off. And I'm just wondering if that's all the sidewalks and the connections over to Potomac Yard and the parks from the west side will actually be completed by the time BRT is open. Yeah, so it should be clear all the way over. Drew, get ready to write the article. Dash yep. was pulled over by yeah. <laughs> with city managers. Arrest. Three members of council. <laughs> We're all like, Justin, Justin, Justin Wilson was behind the wheel. That's a, oh, great. No problem. You can do a no problem. With press to no record it. I'm going to duck back there. When <laughs> That's right, we shot highs in the back. Well, I'm worried about this helicopter. That's right. Yeah, police helicopter. Police helicopter. That, that was for the uh, simulation at the airport. There's a drill in so there. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. the oh, yeah. Yeah. They circled us as we were looking at railroad tracks. Yeah. 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 Yeah.